Great. Good afternoon. Nice to see everyone. I'm going to give everybody a PowerPoint break. I figured by 3.30 you've had a lot. And I'll just um, speak for a few minutes. Um, my name is Dan Greenstein. I am the uh, Chancellor of the Pennsylvania State System for Higher Education. Um, it's a system which is in the middle of a massive transition. I'm going to talk about what that transition entails. Um, and I'm going to address this from the point of view about what that means for folks who may be in this um, audience, but I'm going to do a little polling on, so I can target my remarks more effectively. Who in this audience is a higher education professional working inside the legacy-centric environment? OK, that's us. Good. Um, how about uh, um, uh, service providers, education technology service providers, uh, professional services service providers, um, consultants? It's always a few, right? Good. Uh, did I miss any? Um, anybody kind of belong to an employment category that I didn't call out? All right, so I'm going to try to sort of tailor the remarks to um, talk about what it means to be a, 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 a public university system, which is an undergoing a massive transition. Um, and I'm going to try to talk about what it means in terms of the kinds of partnerships we're looking for. And the reason I thought this might be important, but you can give me feedback afterwards, is that and you're going to see the Pennsylvania State System is really the tip of the tip of the iceberg, which is sort of going to roll across public higher education in this country um, for a variety of reasons, and is going to force a massive change as the demographics of our industry and the costs of our industry change. Um, so we're maybe five or six years ahead of the curve, um, but it's a place where a number of folks are going to end up. This is what the industry is going to look like, and I thought it might be helpful. And I'll try to leave time at the end for some Q&A, because if anything, I need your advice more then you want my information. Let me start quickly with a little bit about who we are. So the Pennsylvania State System is the public university system in the state of Pennsylvania. 14 universities, about 100,000 students. Um, they vary in, in age from about 120 years old to about 180 years old. They started out as normal schools or seminaries. And then they emerged as uh, universities teaching mostly to the master's level. We have one PhD accredited institution, Indiana University. Um, it, the Pennsylvania State System offers the affordable pathway for low and middle income Pennsylvanians uh, to, uh, into sustaining careers. It is still the most affordable option uh, in the state. Highly aligned, career relevant kind of um, education. I mean, it sort of grows out of their history as normal schools and seminaries and that kind of focus on particular in, um, uh, uh, um, employment categories carries forward to this, to this day. The Pennsylvania system Universities and many regional comprehensives like them across this country serve about 25 to 28 percent of the total student population of this country. They, they populate Main Street America and its professions. That's what we have done historically. Um, and as elsewhere, we're going to see are in a, um, a, a major transition point. Our, our universities are um, creatures, as all of these kinds of comprehensive um, universities are. They're creatures of their communities and their student body and their programming and their alignment with uh, employer needs really reflects that. And so again, think about Pennsylvania. There's Philadelphia. There's Pittsburgh. And there's a lot of stuff in the middle, which is neither Philadelphia nor Pittsburgh. Um, since I don't come from Pennsylvania, I don't feel comfortable saying that a lot of people say it's Alabama in the middle. Um, that was a rhetorical device, if anybody recognized. Um, uh, uh, so, but, and, and they really are, when you go to the universities, as you would in many of these kinds of uh, uh, four-year public institutions, they are really creatures of their community. They offer a very intimate kind of experience in terms of their engagement with the community, the kinds of experience that the students have with their faculty. You go there and you talk to people. They've worked there for 25 years. Their, um, uh, uh, their, their parents, their grandparents, their children, their uncles, their nieces, their nephews, their, uh, have all gone to the university. There's a profound embeddedness within the community. Um, that's the good stuff. Uh, we are super challenged uh, by a whole bunch of stuff. Lagging public investment. Pen uh, Pennsylvania is 48th or 49th in the nation in terms of the amount of funding it provides in public higher education on a per FTE basis. 27% uh, of our total, uh, total revenue is derived from the state. As l income as from the state lags, tuition goes up. As tuition goes up, our core population leaves us. So we have lost. Um, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and enroll so you're losing enrollments. Actually, we've lost 18 percent since 2010, and the enrollment decline is fastest among students and faster than the average amongst students from Pennsylvania State families from with incomes of $110,000 or less. So we're losing our, we're pricing ourselves out of the market. You know, it's complicated by the fact that we're in a growth economy. Education is countercyclical. Um, 
The demographic trends in Pennsylvania mimic those more or less um, in the nation, right? You're seeing uh, shrinkage in the uh, size of the high school leaving population. We've seen significant shrinkage since about 20, 2008. Uh, and we're seeing a small uptick now, and then as with the rest of the nation, we're gonna go over a demographic cliff in 2025, right? And of course, all this puts enormous pressure. You see that kind of enrollment decline, puts enormous pressure on the financial situation of any of our universities. And the, the situation is complicated in Pennsylvania by a couple of other factors. Pennsylvania is overcrowded in terms of higher education supply. There are more higher education seats than there are high school leavers available to fill them. There are 92 independents there. Uh, uh, Penn State has a bunch of uh, campuses. There's a bunch of state-related institutions, 113 all in all. And the net result is cutthroat competition, which drives the cost of education up for the middle-income student. Everyone's trying to get the maximum dollar out of that middle-income student and the quality of education arguably down because none of the universities in the sector or the colleges can get as much money as they need to offer the kind of traditional offer they have. Pennsylvania is not unique. The entire northeastern region, I just, I just described Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, right? Minnesota, Wisconsin, down the, south, uh, down the southern coast. And you're gonna see that moving across the north, down the coast and pushing back across the center of the country by 2025. I went to Pennsylvania for this reason because I got to see what's happening before, you know, I wanted to get an advanced copy of the book. So there you go. Um, the, 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 the one other thing I need to say is that the, the situation financially is complicated. I'll get into it in, in just a little more detail in a minute by the fact that the structure of the state system is we're a single bank account, right? So as the weakest universities tug, as they decline, they tug on the stronger ones. Right, because they're effectively part, there's only one corporate entity, it's the Pennsylvania state system, and so everybody's cash is tied up in that. So there's this financial interdependence. Um, so 18% uh, enrollment decline in eight years when you've only, asked, you know, we have been doing recession management, budget management probably for a dozen years or more. Um, uh, I would say reasonably effectively, but there's pretty much nothing left to cut. We did some analytics. We're not publicly recording this, are we? Okay, we did some, we did some analytics, um, and we basically said if the cost and revenue curves don't change, if nothing significant changes, in how long is it before we spend down our, our unrestricted assets, our reserves? Answer, seven to 10 years. Now let me contextualize that for those of you working in the commercial sector, seven to 10 years seems like a long time. Why are you even thinking about it? In higher education, oh my God, that's tomorrow. Right? So seven to 10 years, you're basically out of money if nothing changes, so what do you do? So we looked at all the options, and these are options that you know, others have looked at as well, so there's some playbooks out there that we looked at. So we looked at closure. Only the legislature has, in our state, the um, power to close the university, but you know, the costs of closure are super high. The one-time cash payout costs are far in excess, and if you, you normally close the financially weakest institutions, the cost of closure are far in excess of what those weakest institutions have on hand in cash, like 6x, right? So even if you put aside the financial dislocation, right? In these rural communities, these are the number one, two, or three employers, right? Put all that aside. Put aside the fact that the state inherits the bonded indebtedness, and there's a lot of that, right? Put aside the fact that the state's gonna have to invest in socioeconomic dislocation to alleviate that in the community. There's a lot of money in that. Just put aside all of those you know, intervening variables. The cost of payout, the cost of closure is super high. To bend the cost curve, probably have to close six or seven of 14. I spend an awful lot of time in the Capitol building. I can tell you for a, can't tell you anything for a fact. I can observe that I don't believe that the legislature has the political will necessary to close institution because of all those other issues, right? We looked at consolidation, stuff that they're doing in uh, Georgia, some of that in Texas, um, in various other states. And the challenge for us, and it's a challenge for them too, we looked at it and turned away from it. The reason we turned away from it is that the, the single most important value that any one of the institutions has is its name and brand. The thing that attracts students is that brand name. If you consolidate an institution, you threaten the integrity of the brand. So how many more students are you going to lose as a consequence of consolidation? And the cost savings, as we're seeing in Georgia, they're long-term cost savings, right, as opposed to sort of short-term um, fixes. So consolidation did not look like, and it's also a politically incredibly challenging thing to do, less challenging than closure. Um, but it didn't seem, it, it seemed at least in the first instance, 
uh, while it helped to bend the cost curve, uh, it didn't seem in the first instance to be a viable strategy politically, and it didn't also seem, it, it also had potentially threatening to our revenue base because of the hit that enrollments could take, the further hit that enrollments could take. So we ended up uh, you know, with a kind of a strategy which um, we describe as a sharing system because everything has to have a fan, fun name and then you can talk about it a lot and people remember. Um, so, and, and, and it's, it's a sense that it's, we're moving from uh, a, a system which is organized around 14 universities, basically independent and competing with each other within a certain kind of um, consolidated governance and corporate structure, to one where I think of it in terms of uh, AWS, that you're building out um, an academic infrastructure that universities are using to pursue their own destiny to sort of build their own businesses, right? And that academic infrastructure is not just the back end stuff. We've gone way beyond the time where everybody can do their own payroll and IT services and all the rest of it, HR, et cetera. Um, uh, but it's also front end stuff as well. Really talking about a university where you're leveraging the scale of a 100,000 enrollment entity to grow programs that you, you know, so this sharing system is kind of, so I'm gonna tick through the playbook really quickly. I'm not gonna go through all of it, and then I'm gonna close with some questions. So the sharing system, which I've spoken a bit, it's, it, you know, a number, of, uh, uh, a number of obvious things. It's gotta reduce cost, right? You have got to reduce cost. You can't do everything 14 times. And when I say everything, I think I mean everything, although we're gonna hire a very expensive consultant to help us build the business case of what that portfolio of, of, of services ought to look like going forward. Um, so reducing cost is obviously uh, absolutely um, critical. But then also growing revenues, and as uh, many of you will know, there's only a, a couple of ways to grow revenues in higher education. You lean in on retention, you get in new students, um, or you raise alternative sources. And, and that sharing system, that idea of sharing, collaboration, that deep infrastructure integration is something that we see as critical to both. So on the innovation side, which is where student retention is going to come from, there's evidence in higher education out of Tony Brake's work, but also demonstrably in the work of the University Innovation Alliance and others, that universities, when they work together, can accelerate their time to impact by sharing the learning of the innovators, right? So that sharing system, now we can, heart, we can tackle some of the hardest problems in higher ed, developmental education education, emergency financial aid, student advising, online learning by working together. Um, but you can also think of ways that you can grow revenues. For example, no one of our universities can probably mobilize enough computer scientists to go into data science, to data mining, data science. Generally speaking, together we can. Uh, there was a great article recently about University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, which cut history and a number of other humanities disciplines in order to save costs. Of course, when you cut disciplines, you lose students. There's no reason in a sharing system that you, if you're forced to cut uh, disciplines in order to save costs, that you must deprive your students of access to those disciplines. So there's ways to use sharing in the academic program to, um, to drive new enrollment. We can white label courses in business and aspects of physical assistance and healthcare that, other, that individual universities wouldn't necessarily be able to create on their own and reach into new markets that way. And um, so the sharing system really goes to, and then thinking about private public partnerships in a new way where you're doing private public partnerships across all of your universities, right? Um, and I think of the cogen facilities, the electric generation facilities we have, you know, some really interesting opportunities as an example to think about what it would look like to negotiate public-private partnerships on a statewide basis. Um, okay, so that's a key aspect of the playbook is building out that, that infrastructure, do it to reduce costs, do it to drive revenues. You know, other component parts that I'm not going to talk about, you know, is you've got to put in place a genuine accountability, um, uh, kind of an enterprise management, a uh, set of enterprise management tools that really, for, and, and, and financial policies, how you distribute money to basically drive adoption of that infrastructure, to drive its use. It's no longer negotiable. It's not optional. We can't afford optional. Optional has a name. It's called terminal financial decline. Um, you know, we, the, 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 the third piece I want to talk about is we've added an incubator function. <clears throat> we've done that, we'll do that at the center. Um, you know, the idea of the incubator function, and there's a number about Ed Plus at ASU is a great example. Um, the idea is to connect our university's innovators with one another, accelerating their pace of change, but also with the broader reform community. Um, uh, an incubator function can facilitate fail fast innovation in a whole variety of areas. We're starting with student success and retention initiatives and with um, engaging differently with a workforce aligned program, particularly in the non degree credentialing space, because in a world where high school leavers are shrinking, the number of high school leavers, the only growth market 
is in the adult reskilling and upskilling market, right? So if you want to grow revenues in new students, you have got to go there. And figuring out how to go there from a university, and this is true across the United States, where 90% of your students, where your core market is high school leavers, funnily enough, I've discovered education is not a hose, a fire hose. You can just point at one student group, spray it over there, and then you turn it to the next student group without changing. It doesn't work that way. Adult population is a different marketplace, a different product that it requires. So that incubator function provides that fail fast. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to go into. I think the cultural aspects, employee development is really critical. You're talking about massive behavioral changes, asking people to work differently um, across an, an organization which you know has 13,000 employees. Right? That's not just something you can turn a switch on. So that's a pretty significant bit as well. So let me let me. Um, Finalize. But these are the things I'm wondering about, and these are the questions, and I guess they're kind of some, uh, to foster some conversation. But they're questions which get at the nature of the kind of partnerships that we're going to be seeing. And remember, Pennsylvania, uh, we're ahead of the curve. This wave is coming. This is a tight, anyone seen Nathan Graw's Demographics and Demand for Higher Education? Read that book, you will want to retire by 2025. I mean, it, it, is, it is because that's when the demographic cliff, and he does some analytics which are pretty clever about what the impacts are in higher education. If you're in the top 150 institutions, you are good to go in terms of selectivity, endowment, et cetera, right? Everybody else, you should be scared shitless. That's the technical term. Um, so so, here's, so what, is, what does partnership look like in this kind of industry? So a couple of thoughts. So one is, and this is a hypothesis, I don't think that we're going to have, I, normally in a system when you're doing shared services, there's a binary switch. You build it at the system office and it serves everybody or you put it at a best of breed campus. My guess is that we're, we're not going to be able to do either of those for most of the technology based services. So we're going to need partners who have cloud based services that we can rely on wholesale. Not just in things like um, it's sort of HR payroll, but in things like student advising support, in financial aid packaging, right? Student information systems, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, so that's question number one. Are those cloud-based solutions ready? We talked about um, the rise of the what's called stride thing came up today, and you know, you're seeing some real interesting movement. Um, interesting questions about the skills-based workforce develop workforce aligned programming. So you know, there's some really good work where universities are working closely with employers to figure out what competencies they need in high demand areas. And it lowers the risk of building edu pathways against those competencies, right? Lowers the cost and the risk because you kind of know what you're shooting at. Will employers hire students with those competencies? Uh, they're not now, right? Will they hire students with those competencies if the state acts as the guarantor of the quality of those credentials? I don't know, but that's a big if. Um, uh, interesting question about whether um, professional service providers and vendors will actually not, it's, transformation is not just about the widget. You can't just integrate the product or the professional service. The key is preparing the ground culturally for its integration and use. Research data that um, I've seen on advising reform suggests if you just buy the platform, you're no further forward. If you buy the platform as part of a broader change management agenda, where you're retooling everything you do about advising, you'll get a potentially eight to 12% bump. So our vendors and professional service providers, are, 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 they begin, are they helpful in helping us think through and partnering with us in that change management, change leadership um, activity? Some interesting uh, movement, Civitas is now building out a professional services arm, EAB is beginning to do the same kind of thing around the advising stuff. You know, will we see that in other places? I don't know, it's super interesting. Um, my guess is that the future sales, and this is a big industry, there are a lot of universities that are about to go through this um, experience, so this is, you know, it's a reasonable market, right? Um, uh, so a six, will success in this market increasingly rely upon the ability to provide some level of uh, supports in that area? Um, two more, and then I'm going to shut up. Uh, online, right? The movement into online for a late, a late arrival. You know, the options are OPM. Build your own and you know, have your faculty buy adaptive courseware and just hope, right? There's, is that it? I mean, it, is, is there another, is, is there another, I mean, you could buy, you could, you could be Purdue and buy Kaplan. That's not gonna happen for us, but are those really the only options? Or are there others? And then the last one, and I'll just, this one's just sort of a throwaway because I couldn't help myself, but you know, I spent a lot of time in rural Pennsylvania and it's just a the microcosm of rural America. Um, these economies are severely stressed. These populations are seriously in transition and you've got to help wonder what is going to change the, 
dynamic, and I just, you can't help wondering whether the gig economy, something, is there something about the gig economy which has the potential to revitalize rural America? I don't know, but, and it has nothing to do with this talk, but I thought it was an interesting idea, so I'd throw it out there. Um, so that leaves us with five minutes and 21 seconds and counting down for um, questions. Those are early thoughts. This is seven months in. This is super fun. It is super political. Um, uh, it's, it's been, uh, had a really great time just rebuilding the leadership team at the chancellor's office in order to sort of drive this change agenda. And, you know, I'm now working with a whole bunch of people who've never seen a cliff they didn't want to jump off of. And it's, it's a lot of fun. So, um, and we're keeping this playbook. So, you know, win, lose, or draw, there's going to be something to give back, um, lessons learned. Um, questions, comments, offers of help. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Michael Weinraub, UMUC Ventures. So you asked some great questions at the end. I, I'll, I'll offer this one. So a person in your position who wants to make the argument to your university presidents, a rising tide lifts all boats, yeah. but yet they're all on the hook for their own metrics and their own success and their own enrollment. Yeah. What can you say, what can you do to really make them act such that the, to, to really make that real so that they, they believe that they're not competing against each other, but yeah. they're all really in the same boat. So um, we have one failing university, um, and it has now $30 million of loans for the system. The total number, the total obligation, potentially outside obligation, is $90 million loans from the system. We have just allocated the first $10 million to the campuses proportionally. It just hit their bottom line. They have woken up. They now get it. Right? So one of the things we put in place is a sort of a budget process where um, before any board action is taken on tuition or allocation of uh, state funds is the presidents will actually review each other's strategies and budgets because they're on the hook for failure. Right? So we're now not just, doing co not just inventing new kinds of accountability, we're treating presidents as co-investors because they now understand what it means right, if others fail. And they also understand what it means if others succeed because there's different, um, it gives them access to different. So, you know, I, I'm not going to say hand on heart that all my presidents are lined up behind me waiting for, I mean, you know, a bunch of them are going to be waiting for me to sort of exit left. Um, then they can go on with business as usual. But building the case for change, I mean, the case for change is that significantly urgent. Yeah, that would be my view anyway. Great question. A gentleman in the back and then. All right, gentlemen in the middle got the mic first. Yeah, hey, uh, Kerry Hatch, uh, neighbor to the north, State University of New York. Um, yeah, so everything resonates. Um, but at what point do we start to look and go, you know, it's not just higher ed, it's the whole continuum of education. Yeah. Um, and, you know, thinking about, you know, a 60 year curriculum and what people are going to need for lifelong yeah. learning. Yeah. How do we realign our, not, a lot of what we do is still kind of bailing out the boat yeah. so that it stays afloat, yeah. but not really thinking, okay, what's the new boat look like, or how yeah. do we build that while we're trying not to sink? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We've had a lot of conversation around this, um, and I, I'm going to reflect my chief transformation officer, Sarah Bowder. Um, uh, she has the best title of any job ever, so um, I want her job. Um, her view, and I, I, I embrace it, is that a lot of the stuff I've talked about is just um, stopping the bleed. It's that incubator. It's that innovation, right? And the tendency in this environment, I feel at an emotional level, is to throw everything you have at stopping the bleed. And that would be such a mistake. You have got to run that innovation because you've got to build the future. One of our um, CFOs asked, are we tweaking the system so we work better or are we building the next system? And we debated that for a while and the answer that the group came up with was both has to be both, right? It's, you know, and of course what you do in a situation like this is you pull investment out of the innovation because you're stopping the bleed, right? Which suggests to me you have to cut deeper in order to allocate more to innovation. Super hard to do, forced choice in higher ed. Great question. So I, this is a good talk because uh, what it does is it imparts a sense of urgency to this demographic wave or collapse in 2025. And you kind of hinted that all of your college presidents don't maybe share your sense of urgency with respect to the issue. They're waiting for you to exit stage left and go yeah. on business as usual. I think it's probably fair to say that not every institution has a sense of urgency around this. They yeah. either think that their reputation is such that they'll be able to withstand the, the, the collapse or a tweak to the financial aid formula or something else. Right? And so I guess my question is, what are the two or three things that you can start to do to get an institution ready for this demographic shift when not all the constituents yeah. 
within the institution share that sense of urgency? So, um, so a couple things. Uh, one of the, my, my gut response though is show the data. You know, I mean, in higher ed generally, and I won't speak for other institutions, but there is this tendency to kind of do this management by information hoarding. That's a mistake in my view. I mean, it's hard to, sh to share data and to talk openly about enrollment decline and financial stress because you know, people want to leave and stuff that creates anxiety. Um, but you have to be open and honest with folks and transparent. So I think that helps. Um, and also getting people into what do these data mean. Here's not like, here's my data and this is what they mean. Here's the data, let's discuss what they mean. So I think that's really important. The other thing is if you're in an institution, and many of us are, where they've been doing recession management for a dozen years, everybody feels it, right? I met with students on the campuses and they feel it because the dining services are not open as long because there's not enough as many students to, to make it viable for the vendor to provide you know, service. The trolley car has been cut from one, two to one. So there's, you know, the, the deferred maintenance is obvious of, of five residence halls, two may be closed so the other three can be filled. You, I mean, students, in my view, they've been transitional through higher education. Intentionally, they go in five or six years. And, and so they never feel these kinds of um, stresses. They feel these stresses. If the students feel these stresses, you know for a fact the faculty does and the staff does and they're anxious. And you know, my recipe, and it's like I'm making it up as I go along, but I didn't say that. Um, my recipe is you recognize that anxiety, you embrace it, you acknowledge it, and you infuse it with optimism and hope. I believe we can solve this problem. We have the talent, we have the creativity, we have the people, right? But we have this problem. And those two things have to go together be sober and realistic about the problem, and be absolutely optimism, optimistic about the future and being willing to lay out that vision. I think that combination of anxiety and hope can breed an enormous amount of, uh, can, can pull a wake in change agency. I'll report back in a year, of course, probably from another role. Um, <laughs> I see I'm out of time and I'm gonna get the hook, so um, great questions, great conversation.